During this torque setting, extra effort is being asked for in the valve's opening action. The actuator provides this by making its motor work harder. This diagram shows how it does this. When resistance occurs on the output shaft, the rotor shaft will naturally screw itself forward along the worm wheel. It is allowed to do this during which time the motor develops full effort, which is transmitted to the valve's mechanism. When the rotor shaft moves forward, it compresses this preloaded spring pack. At the same time, through this helix, the forward motion is converted into a rotary one, which, by contact with the front plate, activates this switch, the same switch that operates the positional limit, incidentally. But more of that in a moment. To prevent resetting of this switch, a mechanical latch holds the striker in place. This same latch prevents the open torque switch from tripping when a sticky valve is being opened. Precisely the same action occurs in the opposite direction. The rotor shaft moves back, compressing this spring pack this time. The helix converts the axial movement to a rotary one, and the switch is tripped. Let's see that again. The torque selectors having been preset, a resistance in the valve is felt by the actuator. The rotor shaft moves forward. This spring pack is compressed and this one expands. Through the helix, the motion becomes a rotary one, and the striker plate operates the switch. Only the front switch has been tripped. The other two, as we said before, are for indicator connection or interlock with other valves and can only be tripped by the limit switch drive. As we saw earlier, different valve types require different combinations of actions from the actuator. For example, a simple stop-start at both the open and close limits on this plug valve, but with additional torque for production. Extra torque at the closed end, but just the position limit on the open end on this wedge gate valve. Extra torque on this pipeline conduit valve, so it will unseat against full pressure but with a bypass limit switch during the cracking action, so the torque switch will not trip while the initial hammer effect is taking place. Because of these multiple requirements, it would appear that a complex switch circuit like this would be needed. As you can see, it employs six switches. And in the early row torque designs, this is how it was, and incidentally, still is with some of our competitors. And this is how it operates. In the opening direction, as we just explained, both a limit and a torque switch are needed. But an additional limit switch is also required to bypass the torque switch to stop it tripping off during the initial opening effort. And in the closing direction, an additional open limit switch is needed to bypass the effects of the closed limit switch just on closing. However, the modern Rotorx switch design is much simpler. It employs only two electrical switches. The selection of whether a switch operates as a reaction to torque or to a positional limit is determined by mechanical setting of cams. As you saw, torque bypass is achieved with this mechanical latch. It prevents the open torque switch from tripping until some physical movement has been felt. This latch also prevents repeating hammer action if the button is kept depressed, or if automatic control is left to run. Unlike some competitive actuators, once the torque switch trips at the end of travel, it stays put. So, all the problems of valve control are dealt with by the A-range switch mechanism.
the employment of just two electrical switches plus mechanical selection of torque and limit controls plus mechanical latching result in increased reliability through simplicity. The employment of just two electrical switches plus mechanical selection of torque and limit controls plus mechanical latching result in increased reliability through simplicity.